we have our next uh, panel on another very interesting question of what to do about equitable growth. How can we get there? Uh, so many uh, sort of uh, disparities and divisions. How can we best get to that point? Um, my colleague, uh, Ileana uh, Kozienko, will be the moderator and lead that panel. It's uh, slated to begin at half past two, I believe, Ileana. So, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to take a short break, that's fine. If you want to start right away, it will give you a little bit more time. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't anticipated that. Um, I believe, yes, everybody is here. Um, do you guys want to start a bit earlier? All right, let's do it. Um, all right. Well, so, you, I'll, I'll let you introduce everyone. Yeah. Thank you all for well, us. thank you so much. And thank you for, um, in, for inviting me to uh, be the moderator of this final panel. Um, we are going to, uh, I think, have a similar format. Uh, each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and then I might kick off with a few questions um, for them, and then we'll open it up um, to the audience uh, after that. So I couldn't think of any better um, order, so we're just going to go alphabetically. Um, so uh, Trevon Logan will be our first speaker. Um, he is the Hazel C. Youngberg Distinguished Professor of Economics at The Ohio State University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, he's held visiting, um, a variety of visiting appointments. Um, the one I'll mention is Princeton's uh, Center for Health and Wellbeing. Um, and, and Trevon is, uh, you know, his specialty is in economic, one of his specialties is economic history. He's on the editorial board of explorations uh, in economic history, as well as um, demography and um, applied microeconomics. Um, he got his BA, a BS in economics from University of Washington, Madison, and then his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. So I will, um, give the floor over to Trevon and then introduce um, Katerina and Gabriel uh, before uh, their remarks and then we'll discuss together. Thank you, Ayana, for uh, that very um, kind uh, <laughs> introduction. Um, I know she's a, a Michigan fan and I'm a Buckeye, so this can't be um, <laughs> no, no I'm, a, I'm a Notre Dame fan, but that's a different thing. Oh, same difference. Um, <laughs> but uh, today I want to talk about it, the racial fractures of American economic policy, and I'll jump um, right in it so that I can keep on time. Um, the question of how we can make growth more equitable, I think really lies in looking at how we have deliberately in the United States in particular, made growth unequal up to this point. And, this um, brief deluge into a couple of issues, we'll talk about race as being one of the most salient factors in that. And these are not accidental or unintended policies. This is a deliberate um, set of policies from the founding of the nation, which has taken people out of the growth and wealth development path and moved others to that path purposefully. So the real question isn't how can we make growth um, more equitable? The question is, do we want to make growth more equitable? in the United States? Is there anything in our historical record that tells us that this is something that we uh, um, wanted to achieve? So we can start thinking about the inequities in COVID-19, which as of today um, has killed one in, um, 645 African-Americans. Um, in August, it was one in 1,000. And um, COVID-19 is the third leading cause of death for African-Americans in the year uh, 2020. Only heart disease and cancer killed more people, and it will reduce overall life expectancy at birth um, by more than two years on average. And this widening of this life expectancy gap just due to the coronavirus erases more than a decade of gains um, that we've had in the relative life expectancy differences between Black and white Americans. So from the proceeding for the National Academy of Sciences published just this year, we can see that the largest source of declines in life expectancy overall, and in particular also in declines in life expectancy over the age of 65 are concentrated among Black and Hispanic people. And we know that this has had an impact on the well-being of African-Americans through this pandemic. 
higher unemployment for Black Americans, slower recovery for Black Americans, significantly higher levels of food insecurity over the summer. Um, nearly a third of all how Black households with children were food insecure. And we have higher levels of stress, psychological stress and emotional stress due to these economic anxieties and the inability to meet basic expenses that is also racially disproportionate. Even when you go down to benefits themselves, some really um, shocking results from Javay Grooms and her co-authors finds that African-Americans have to wait a week longer to receive their unemployment benefits than other racial groups. And this is conditional on applying at the same time. So some ways in which the social safety net operates, operates in a racially disparate way, which puts people who already have relatively few economic resources even further behind. And so this pandemic has seeped into all of this racial inequality. That's certainly a narrative that we have, but that racial inequality is deeply rooted in American economic policy. So the very first thing that people will look at are the racial wealth disparities. Um, black people lack the wealth to truly weather a recession, let alone a sort of pandemic that puts people into economic freefall. We know that these wealth numbers, and these are coming from the Survey of Consumer Finances circa 2019, is that Black wealth at the median is one-tenth, basically, of white wealth at the median. Even more shocking is the fact that the typical socioeconomic correlates of wealth do work in a positive direction for African Americans, but the level differences are absolutely astounding. A white person without a high school degree or a GED has at the median $71,000 in wealth. An African-American with a college degree at the median has less than $50,000 in wealth. So our traditional answers of education will close wealth gaps, et cetera, simply don't apply to the large racial wealth gaps that we see. It is also the case that Black Americans are the only racial group in the United States where less than half of the Black population could get $3,000 from family and friends. Every other racial and ethnic group in the United States is above 55%. You add an economic catastrophe to that sort of racial gap in one social network's ability to produce some level of liquidity, and you have people who are literally um, in the most depraved economic conditions in this country. If you're looking at growth itself and income growth, we also know that that has been racially disparate as well. Between 2005 and 2019, African-American median household income grew the lowest of any other racial or ethnic group. Overall in the United States, it grew at around 2%, um, 2.3%, but Black, uh, Asian and Hispanic incomes at the median grew by more than 5%. And once again, we see African-Americans lagging behind and their incomes only growing at 1.9% over the last 15 years. So what are the historical fractures that lead to sort of this racial disparity? There are three that I think are particularly important. There is the reconstruction experience, there is legalized segregation and discrimination. And then there's a civil rights and post-civil rights era. What I wanna stress about each of these experiences is not simply the exclusion of African-Americans or discrimination against African-Americans. It is the fact that the federal government itself has redistributed wealth to white Americans at the exclusion of black Americans. So it is not that we have not had policies that encourage growth and that encourage wealth accumulation. It is that those policies have deliberately excluded African-Americans. We can start with Reconstruction, a period in which African-Americans enter into American political life as citizens. Recalling, remember, that as of 1857 in the Dred Scott decision, African-Americans, whether they were slave or free, had no rights which whites were bound to. Once citizenship is granted in the 13th Amendment, and then we move to the 14th Amendment, and we move to the 15th Amendment of, of, of enfranchisement, African Americans do enter political office and have office holders who have a unique perspective on wealth redistribution. Their idea is to tax the wealth of white plantation owners in the South for the purposes of redistribution and public finance. 
to enact the first public school system in the South and to redistribute some land by increasing the opportunity cost of holding land and in inventory for white landowners. So what happens to those people? They are able to raise taxes immediately in the early years of reconstruction, but they are literally violently forced out of office for having these policies of wealth redistribution. They're more likely to be met with violence and we see a reversion of tax policy to low levels of per capita taxes at reconstruction's end. So our first attempt to redistribute wealth in the United States in a way that would eliminate some of these black white gaps was met with literal violence. This continues and the work of Jacoba Williams enforces the fact that racial terrorism was about political disenfranchisement of African-Americans. Areas that had high levels of lynchings between the 1880s and the 1930s continue to this day to have lower levels of African-American political participation. This racial violence is about excluding African-Americans from the political process, which is where we enact policies to redistribute wealth and also to provide for public goods. Even to this day, in some joint work with Bradley Hardy and Jacoba Williams, we find that states that had greater numbers of historical lynchings have lower minimum wages, have lower state uh, EITC take up rates, and have higher poverty rates. The policies of the places that enacted racial terrorism in the past have a different set of poverty policies to this day. And this deliberate exclusion of African Americans can literally walk through every step of American history, whether we're talking about the exclusion of African Americans from the Homestead Act and the Southern Homestead Act, being excluded from universities which are established in the Morrill Land Grant Act, the GI Bill and Veterans Assistance being racially discriminatory from the Civil War Union Army um, pensions down to the present, federal home loan guarantees and the redlining of neighborhoods, infrastructure creation, which simultaneously destroyed African-American communities and allowed for suburbanization, which built upon racially restrictive covenants and increased the wealth holdings of white Americans, the war on poverty and its racial exclusion, where Southern states refused to accept the resources if they were to be distributed in a racially non-discriminatory way, and minimum wage policy itself, which from its impetus excluded occupations that were heavily African-American. These policies towards taxation and public goods are a hallmark of racial politics. When people are talking about small government, they are invoking ideas that go back to a very significant racial hierarchy in our country's history. Low levels of investment in public goods and low rates of social mobility are concentrated in these places in the African American South because they were first formed there in the earliest years of Reconstruction. So as we move forward, creating equitable growth in the future requires acknowledging the ways that race has shaped our history. It is not about individualized discrimination, which is really the hallmark of what economists study, but it is the product of government-sponsored policy. Almost every other group in the United States has benefited somewhat from extensive wealth transfers sponsored by the federal government except for African-Americans. So we have to think about what the true roots are in our apparently race neutral policies in acknowledging the ways that race has informed those economic policies. Thank you so much, Trevon. Our next speaker is uh, Katerina Pistor, who is the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia Law School and an expert in comparative law and corporate governance. Um, her most recent book um, is The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality um, from Princeton University Press, uh, 2019. Um, so the floor is yours, Katerina, and um, I believe you can share slides. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Good. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk both to Trevon and to Gabriel today. And I think actually the order makes a lot of sense because Trevon honed in on a specific discrimination that was condoned, endorsed and practiced by the federal government and other levels of government. I think Gabrielle is focusing more, mostly on, on, on redis redistribution. And I have another aspect of pre-distribution, but I think it's very complementary to what Trevon just told us. 
So um, I think when we want to understand how to move forward, we have to do a, an, a diagnosis or autopsy, an institutional autopsy of where we are first. And I'm honing in in the book that you just mentioned, but also more broadly in my, my work on the, on the institutional structures that are used to create private wealth and how they operate. So I'm interested in this pre-distribution. How is wealth created first before it's being redistributed? I think if we, before we take away the eggs that the golden goose has laid, we have to understand sort of who has the golden goose and why did they get it? Um, and so um, I will talk about also the political economy of private law in this context, because I'm, I'm focusing mostly on private law institution, property right, collateral law, um, co corporate law, trust law, bankruptcy law as well, and contract law. And then we'll talk about how we can roll back perhaps some of the private legal privileges that have been created in this fashion, but also maybe um, uh, develop strategies of legal empowerment and, and of course eliminate state discrimination to the extent it's still working today. And I agree with Trevon that it's still very prevalent here. So just as the basic building blocks, I'm basically saying with others that capital is a wealth generating asset, but I'm saying is you, you can't understand how it works if you don't understand how the law works, because it's actually the legal coding that gives ordinary objects, a piece of land, a machine, you have it, an idea, a claim to future cash flows, a promise to payment. Um, it requires these legal attributes to turn them into a, a capital asset. And what you need are basically three out of the four attributes I identify here is you need priority. You have to have better rights than others, stronger rights. You want to have durability, which basically means you want to protect assets against too many creditors for longer periods of time. And so we're trying to create a, an artificial legal veil or shield to protect assets against too many other claimants. We want to make these attributes enforceable against the world, not only against private parties. And then convertibility really is how financial assets attain a level of durability. It's not only the transferability, it's not only that you can trade a claim, but if that if in doubt, you can actually convert it into a safer asset. Ideally, you want to go to the central bank and get liquidity in times of crisis so that you can log in past gains by converting your private assets now into, into cash holdings, which do not lose their nominal value. They may lose their real value, but nominal value counts for a lot in the times of crisis. So it is really the law, and, and I'm basically thinking of state and law as actually as power. It's a particular way in which we have institutionalized power. So enforceability is what gives these differently pri different privately coded assets um, their, their wealth producing capacity. Um, it's ultimately the expectation that this can be enforced against the world. So I'm focusing on the dimension of law that works mostly in the horizontal relationship between citizens and the ability of citizens to avail themselves or harness this institutionalized form of coercion for their own purposes when they organize their relation with others. So it's less the state citizen relationship that Trevon I think has focused on and that is also part of the tax structure. It is also not so much the citizen state, I want to have my individual rights protected protect against the state, but it's a citizen citizen relationship, which in fact is always a triangular relationship because you always invoke state power to have stronger rights against others. At least if you don't use physical force, you're relying on legal power. So in the book, I just basically show how this works and how, how this has worked for land, firms, debt, know-how over time. You can extend that. I'm not gonna run through this here, what I do want to say here is that access to legal coding strategies that make sure that my interest is recognized as a property right, um, or that I have stronger rights over others, or that I might actually be exempted from the ordinary operation of the code and get a safe harbor, as we, as we call this, which basically means everybody else has to follow the rules, but I'm exempt from it because of a specific asset or I'm a specific kind of entity that shall be exempt or whether I have standing even in court to defend my rights, sort of is all non-random, right? So you have to have literacy, you have to know how the law works. And you can show this when the commoners were pushed off the land by the landlords in, in England, um, they lacked literacy. They also very often lacked standing in a court of law because they were trying to enforce collective rights rather than individual rights in the court side, you don't have standing here. And they certainly also very often lacked resources, which is not to say that they didn't try, but they certainly from the get-go had a harder time defending their rights. And I think a lot of that could also be said for the freedmen 
Japan in in in, in United States after um, the emancipation, trying to protect the rights that some of them had received afterwards, even if they paid for that afterwards, um, was um, made much more difficult because they didn't have access to the legal processes that might have protected um, their rights. Uh, another way in which um, we have created a highly inequitable um, uh, way of trying to code capital is um, by reinforcing regulatory competition. So there is something positive to be said about regulatory competition because sometimes certain rules might be inefficient and giving people a choice might be giving them some flexibility. But mostly those who have greater resources and are in the know can choose. And then they can choose to incorporate a company in a tax haven, or they can choose to um, uh, set up a, a financial intermediary bank in, in a state that has um, very high usury rules, but or, or allows usury uh, level interest rates, but then uh, carry their transactions to consumers elsewhere and still get this enforced. All these mechanisms are um, embedded in our legal system. The choice of law rules are not so much known outside legal professions, but they're really important because they give some who know how to use them the choice to pick the rules by which they wish to be governed and impose them on others who don't really have a choice. Um, in part, that's a, a question of bargaining power. In part, it's because we're using the idea of integrating markets, commerce clause, etc., to make sure that people actually can, can play this game. And play this game not only within the US or within the European Union, but play this game increasingly um, globally. So what are the, the countermeasures? Um, one thing that I address at the end of the book is basically to think about how to roll back the legal steroids that we have allowed private parties to use excessively, how to um, make sure that they can't excessively use these asset shielding devices that give them durability, how to roll back, back safe, safe harbors or make it less easy to pick and choose the law by which they wish to be governed and or by the judges by which they shall be tried using then state courts only to execute rulings that others might not comply with, but really ex escaping the legal system except for the enforceability, right? We always want to have these enforceability in the background and rely on that. But th that probably is only the first step or it, it not only probably, it's certainly only the first step because it gives us some breathing space to rethink how we want to uh, reorder the legal system to give others a more equitable um, uh, um, place to start. What we also need um, is a, a, a real recoding project. We need uh, legal empowerment uh, for more. And of course, it's a huge political economy question whether we can get this. But just strategy-wise, what we should do is, is one, of course, to eliminate state discrimination, uh, which is overt in many um, uh, areas. And we have active abolition debates uh, going on. And, and they, they need to go on because we have to name these things and try to get over them. There are lots of indirect state discriminations as well, um, uh, which are sort of using cash fines or cash bail to discriminate against those who don't have cash and thereby exclude them um, from society, econo the economy, from political systems through voting rights, etc. So there, there's lots of work to be done there. Um, then I think the other thing that we have to, to really recognize is that a lot of the wealth creation in the private sector historically over time, and that's how we build the resilience against crisis, has come from the element of durability I mentioned earlier which is basically a legal insurance against loss um, uh, that might come from so the proverbial exogenous shock or a crisis that we haven't fully foreseen. So the ability to separate assets out and protect them so that not too many creditors can get a hold of them allows me to incubate wealth over time. Um, another way to think about this is to make sure that we have access to um, maybe a social insurance rather than the privately created insurance or that we um, basically have, I call this here, property plus. Uh, which is what the English landlords did. They didn't only get priority, they also used their new property rights to protect them against their creditors by using old fashioned legal institutions, the entail, the trust, et cetera, to make sure that they couldn't grab um, their, their, their assets. How to transpose this into a different context is something that requires some legal engineering, but is not, I think, belong beyond um, uh, reach. And then last but not least, and I think here's where I'm meeting up with Trevor maybe more, most explicitly, is um, how to think about the so-called new property, as Reich called this in the 1960s. Because the state handouts are very often substitutes for the private wealth that many parts of the population were not able to create. 
but the state handouts don't have durability. You know, they're only relatively weak reliance protections that we give people who get this, but in principle, it's always contingent. The state can take it back. And so if we change state policies, then we no longer have that. Whereas the private legal codings have been used to, to, uh, to protect private wealth over time, over long stretches of time, and were made durable even against the state itself because we protect them through private property rights protections in our constitutions. So this is just a, a final slide of my, my book, I, I, but I, let me just stop here and, and, and listen to Graviel, and I think then we should go to a uh, Q&A. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Katarina. Um, our final speaker for the panel is Gabrielle Zuckman, um, who is Associate Professor of Economics at UC Berkeley and Director of the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Center on Wealth and Income Inequality. Uh, his research focuses on income and wealth inequality, taxation of wealth, global um, tax havens. Uh, he is the author of a recent book, actually one that we had your co-author, um, Emmanuel Saez, uh, give a book talk at Princeton sometime before the pandemic. Um, the recent, your recent book is The um, Triumph of Injustice about uh, sort of the evolution of US tax policy. Um, so uh, Gabrielle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Iliana. Thanks uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Here we go. And so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about progressive wealth taxation and drawing some lessons from the past to think about the, the future. So the starting point is that there is a demand today for progressive wealth taxation in the US. When you ask Americans, for instance, whether they support a tax on wealth that would start at $50 million in net wealth. If you have 50 million, you pay zero. If you have more, you pay something, 2%, let's say a mini dollar above 50 million. 70, 80% of Democrats say yes, but also a majority of Republican voters and independent voters say that they support such a policy. There are two ways to understand why this is so popular. One is that uh, there's been a massive increase in wealth concentration in the US. And the second is that the current US tax system uh, fails, in my view, to, to, to uh, tax uh, the very wealthy properly. And uh, this is due to two reasons. One is that when you're extremely wealthy, if you think about billionaires, it's very easy to structure your wealth in such a way that your wealth generates little taxable income. So you take Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, the Google founders, you know, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Elon Musk, all of them, they're all in the, among the top 10 wealthiest Americans. They are big shareholders of businesses that do not distribute dividends. They don't pay themselves a high wage, you know, sometimes a very low wage. And so their taxable income is just a tiny, tiny fraction of their wealth or a tiny, tiny fraction of their true economic income, which is their share of Amazon's profit, Berkshire Hathaway's profits, Alphabet's profits, and so on. Um, and the second thing is that in the past, when the corporate tax was high, and in the US it's been very high in the post-World War II decades, you know, with statutory rates of 50%, effective tax rates that were close to 50%, this, you know, when the corporate tax was high, this kind of addressed that issue in the sense that these big shareholders of big companies didn't pay much income tax, but at least they pay taxes through the corporations that they own. Now, with the rise of profit shifting to tax havens, with international tax competition, with the race to the bottom with respect to corporate income tax rates that we've seen over the last decades, and most particularly with the tax reform of 2017, you know, that cut the US tax rate from 35% to 21%. Now the reality is that you know, th this backstop, the corporate tax, which used to be a backstop has uh, severely been eroded. So just to illustrate these two things, the rise of inequality, I, I like to show this graph these days. You know, so the top 1% is very much uh, you know, 2009 uh, Occupy Wall Street. Today is the top 0.0000001% that gets a lot of attention. This is the 18 wealthiest uh, 
individuals in the US, their wealth is easy to measure. Essentially, they are shareholders of listed companies. It's tracked by Forbes magazine since 1982. This tiny group of the population owned less than 0.2%, about 0.12% of total US wealth in the early 1980s. Today, it owns about 1.2% of total US wealth, so 10 times more. Okay, so you, that illustrates the rise of the ultra wealthy, the ultra billionaires. And you know, this dot, the last dot here is for actually July 2020. If we updated this graph today, it would be even higher, you know, because of the rise in particular of you know the, the stock market, especially you know Amazon and shares like that uh, during the pandemic. Um, if you look at the progressivity of the U.S. tax system, and we tried our best to allocate all taxes at all levels of governance to the various groups of the population, and here is what we found, as my colleague Emmanuel said, we found that the U.S. tax system is kind of roughly a giant flat tax where each group of the population, all included, pays roughly the same fraction of their income in taxes, except the very wealthy, the top 400 here, so essentially billionaires who pay you know, less than the working class or less than the middle class for the reason that I mentioned earlier, which is when you're very rich, you can reduce your taxable income to relatively uh, low uh, levels. So is that an ideal situation? And so from there, you know, it's kind of logic that if you have two types of wealthy people, you have wealthy people who have a lot of wealth and relatively little taxable income and vice versa, you have people who have a lot of taxable income and not a lot of wealth. If that's the reality, and I think it describes the reality rather well, you want two instruments. You want a wealth tax and you want an income tax. You, know, if you have two dimensions of heterogeneity. Now, when you start thinking about along those lines, I think the really interesting question is not whether wealth tax is desirable, because I, the case in my view at least is pretty strong. The more interesting question is, can it work? And um, when you start thinking about whether it can work, it's natural to look at um, what has happened in history. Many countries have or have had wealth taxes. And, and, and to be clear, this um, history, this experience, is not a huge success. Uh, is I would even say that it's more like you know rather in most cases a pretty big failure, you know, intellectual, political, administrative uh, failure. But it's a failure that we can analyze, that we can understand, and fr from which we can draw lessons from the future. So European countries that had wealth taxes, uh, there were three main limitations. First, European countries never tried to limit tax competition. So if you're a very wealthy person in France, France used to have a wealth tax until 2018, and you move to Switzerland, you know, from January 1st, you had no tax anymore to pay in France. No limit to tax competition. The US is the opposite extreme. If you're a US citizen and you decide to move to the Cayman Islands, you know, good for you, but you still have to pay taxes in the US until, uh, uh, you know, for the rest of uh, your life. Second problem with the European experience with wealth taxation is that European countries were very weak for a long time, and although it has changed in the last 10 years, but historically have been very weak when it came to fighting tax evasion, and in particular, wealth concealment in tax havens. So there is a big industry in Switzerland, historically, in many other places, that targets the very wealthy and helps them avoid and sometimes evade taxes. And until 2017, there was no exchange of bank information between financial institutions in Switzerland and tax authorities in France, Germany, and so on, making it really easy for the rich to hide assets. And it was a pretty big issue. The third problem was that the wealth taxes that existed in Europe typically had a relatively low exemption threshold. I mentioned 50 million, you know, at the beginning of my uh, remarks uh, for the debate about wealth taxation today in the US. In Europe, the wealth taxes started at around $500,000 or, you know, less than a million dollars. So it reached, they reached a much uh, bigger fraction of the population, which gave rise to uh, all sorts of uh, uh, lobbying for exemptions, 
deductions uh, uh, and, and so on, which uh, led to base erosion and at the end of the day, taxes that, that didn't properly tax the, the very rich. So the point I want to make, and I don't want to take too much time, too long, is that um, it's not because the experience was not a huge success that we cannot make a wealth tax work today. So it's very important to understand that elasticities are not immutable parameters. With a proper tax design, we can reduce them. In particular, tax competition is not a law of nature. It's a policy choice. You can choose not to tax non-residents, or you can choose to tax them. Um, tax evasion, the same. You know, you can choose not to collect information. You can choose not to regulate the supply of tax evasion services, or you can choose to, to, to regulate that industry. And base erosion can be addressed by taxing all assets at their market values, even you know, creating markets when these market values are missing. And if you start high enough in the wealth distribution, you don't need, if you start at $50 million, there's no reason to give exemptions or deductions for certain assets. You know, everybody understands that if you own 50 million in wealth, you're very rich, you have a high uh, uh, capacity to pay taxes and you know, don't need any uh, favors. Let me just uh, conclude these two uh, slides very briefly. This is you know, the progressivity of the US tax system, but now if we added a wealth tax at the rate of 2% above $50 million, 3% above $1 billion. You know, you can see that it would make a pretty big difference in terms of the progressivity of the tax system at the very top end. And you might say, oh, you know, what of that? It's not, never going to happen. You know, it's utopian. I'm personally much more optimistic because I look at the history of US taxation and it's full of U-turns. And before 1913, uh, the income tax was unconstitutional. Many economists thought that it would never work, that people would avoid the income tax, evade it. And you know, look, the constitution changed. The US developed the information infrastructure that makes it possible to limit uh, uh, tax evasion. And now everybody understands that the, the, you know, I think most people agree that income tax is, is a pretty big success and works relatively well. And the US went very high with the progressivity of the income tax. In 1912, there's no income tax. So the top marginal income tax rate is zero. 19, you know, 1940s, 1950s, it's you know, almost as high as 100%, you know, 92%, 93%. So everything is possible. And uh, I think it's totally uh, possible to, to uh, imagine that in the future, there might be a, a progressive wealth taxation in the US. This is my conclusion. If you want to uh, read more about these issues, this, uh, uh, this is you know, basically taken from our book with many what says, The Triumph of Injustice. Thank you very much. Hi, um, so I'm gonna ask a few questions and then I'll be um, grabbing some questions from the Q&A. So my first question is uh, for Turban. Um, so earlier in the day, we had a number of uh, uh, speakers talk about the decline in public investment, you know, sort of a high point might be the trip to the moon. Um, and, you know, there's any, any number of statistics you can look at that shows we don't have the same public investment. And I wondered if you, to connect that theme of the conference with uh, your talk, you know, back then, you know, we could basically exclude a certain part of our population after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, that becomes more difficult. Do you connect the two, like sort of the return to doing smaller stuff, small government, no public investment, to the fact that now legally after the civil rights movements, it's harder to exclude a group that um, the majority was able to exclude before? Yes, I, I, I do agree with that. And I think um, if you're thinking about the high point of American investment, you can think about earlier movements, um, Claudia Golden's work about Americans expansion of high school education, which is a massive public investment, which paid huge dividends for us as a society, was regionally very heterogeneous. And so we had high investments in areas that were racially homogeneous. Mm -hmm. well, most of the nation had high school enrollment rates above 70% and high school graduation rates far above 50%. The American South, with its racial heterogeneity, lagged behind the nation. They had lower than 30% high school graduation rates. So at every aspect where we start thinking about high watermarks of public investment, mm 
still have this regional and racial dynamic uh, that underlies that lack of public investment. That's really been a hallmark of ways in which we can exclude African-Americans public investment. The work say, for example, of your colleague Leah Bustam, which looks at the rise of suburbanization is not just about living separately from people of different races, but is also critically about not sharing public goods with people of different races. And that is a hallmark of American um, public policy and particularly public finance. So move to this post-civil rights era, the question is how can we have these racially restrictive policies? And lo and behold, it coalesces with the rise of Reagan type conservatism, which starts state block grants and other sorts of things that now can dilute the ability of the government to deliver those public goods to the public writ large and exclude African-Americans, particularly in their administration. So those state block grants are a great segue to my um, next question, which is for Katarina. Um, you know, I just think about your, your one of your final points being that social insurance as a substitute for wealth you know, it's meant in some ways as a substitute for those uh, who don't had didn't have the you know generations past ability to accumulate wealth, but they're so contingent on the political mood of the country. Suddenly, we could start block granting Medicaid, uh, and that you know that guarantee would no longer be there. So it got me thinking: Does that push you toward replacing social insurance with things like a sovereign wealth fund or a citizen's dividend? That is sort of cash to every citizen in the country and sort of maybe would be less contingent? You know, it depends very much on how we structure these things, um, right? And, and, and whether these things are available at the right time for most people. But um, I, I, in principle, yes. I think what we need is to make sure that those who are less resilient, have less wealth today are better protected against shocks. And I think when you think about COVID and how we will emerge from the COVID crisis, one of the big issues is, you know, where, where do we actually pool our resources together, make sure that we get out of this? And uh, what I hear mostly right now is how to make sure that our financial intermediaries can get rid of the non-performing loans and, and clean up their balance sheets again. And that's what we know how to do. But in truth, it's really those on the on the periphery of our very hierarchical system, um, the the poor, the minorities that are feeling the brunt of the crisis, and um, and and we do not have the institutional mechanisms in place to make sure that they get the right resources. So if we had, you know, a sovereign wealth fund, or let's say if we had wallets with the Federal Reserve that could provide the liquidity if and when needed, but those institutional structures would have to build in that way, and that's of course mostly a political issue. It's not a technical one; it's a political one. Um, and then my question for Gabrielle, uh, your proposal, and in fact, you were quite uh, clear that one of the challenges of European wealth taxes was that they were almost, you know, too aggressive. You know, they were taxing the upper middle class 500,000K, 500K in, uh, in wealth. But is there any, the only way to sort of get at sort of the median um, the, the gaps in median wealth that uh, Trevon had talked about would be something a little bit uh, more aggressive. You know, how do we think about, you know, the gaps in median wealth, or is that something that you don't think tax policy uh, is the right tool to address? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, uh, tax policy and wealth for distribution is uh, one key uh, way to, uh, uh, you know, reduce the uh, wealth gap between African Americans and and, and whites, and I think we need to reconnect with the efforts that were made, you know, the, the failed efforts at the time of reconstruction, and and uh, to, to to do that. And the starting point is just to to realize, you know, that there is enormous wealth and largely untaxed wealth uh, uh, at the top of the wealth distribution uh, in the U.S. So that taxing that wealth just, you know, you don't have to tax. Uh, uh, people with five hundred thousand dollars, but just taxing the wealth of the top zero point one percent, you know, that owns something in, be in between 17, 18, 19 percent of total U.S. wealth, but that's something like twenty trillion dollars in wealth today. The the revenue potential of such taxes is uh, is very significant, mm -hmm. uh, and and the potential for reducing the uh, white black wealth gap uh, is very large. And I think the starting, you know, the, we need to recognize that, and we need to recognize that. Uh, 
there has been extremely, uh, as, as Trevon was saying, a little, almost no progress uh, uh, over the last uh, 150 years in reducing uh, the white black wealth gap. So if you look at, I think what's the most meaningful or the clearest statistic is you compute the average wealth of African Americans as a fraction of the average wealth of uh, white people. And you know, in 1870, this is essentially zero. Today, this is around 15, 16, 17 percent. But you know, so equality would be a ratio of one, 100 percent. And in 150 years, the US has moved from zero to 15 percent. So th this is this is a major uh, issue, and this is uh, something that that wealth distribution could uh, could could address in part. Um, let me ask one more, uh, let me ask one more question, um, before I start looking at the Q and A. Um, so Trevon, I mean, one thing I, I think about whenever I, uh, whenever I think about racial inequality in the U.S., I feel like there's a bit of this trade-off in the sense that, you know, the more you learn about it, it's, you know, very, uh, overwhelming. And then the, tra not the trade-off, but like the implication of that is it also feels like to, to learn how racist past policies have been makes you feel politically like nothing will ever happen. Like the more racist you sort of learn about the US past, the less you can see, um, you know, some avenue for like racial justice. So how do you, is there any, do you take any hope? Um, I mean, I don't wanna ask you to be, to, oh, you know, end on a happy note, you know, give us some optimism, but I wanna know your take about you know, can we have sort of discussions about race-based justice or is our best practical strategy to think about race-neutral class-based policy? I'm thinking about like Alora, Alora's work showing that, you know, the minimum wage and making it more universal, you know, it, you know, it seems to explain a large share of the decline in uh, racial gaps in the 1960s. It wasn't explicitly about civil rights. It was about, um, you know, making a making the policy truly race neutral. So, just purely as a strategic point, is um, is sneaking in racial justice through more class based but race neutral policies like the only way forward? Given the sort of given the the views of the majority, Amer the typical American citizen. Yeah, that's a very, very good uh, question. I, I think that it really is sort of this hallmark in American public policy in general that we have racially designed policies that we wish, we wish to undo with race blind solutions. So we use a hammer and we nail something in and then we want to use a screwdriver to correct that mistake, right? So clearly we're not going to solve the fundamental problem, but we can close those gaps significantly. So we think about um, policies like baby bonds, for example, which would help to close the black white mm -hmm. gap, but it would not eliminate it. Mm -hmm. Things like canceling student loan debt would help to close black white wealth gaps, but it would not eliminate it. But the reason that we have these gaps are because of racial conscious policies. And so it is, you know, just from a logical standpoint, it's not going to be possible, possible to have complete elimination um, of these gaps with something that is not race conscious. And this raises an additional question of why a partial elimination is what is satisfactory to us when a total elimination is actually feasible. So that gets to the heart of sort of the racial politics that we exist in, in other words, where we have deliberately harmed a group of people and our solution is to only make them partially whole, is that because these victims are, are themselves black and we haven't sought the same sort of um, lack of restorative justice with other groups. So I do think feasible policies are typically going to be race neutral policies, but that in and of itself admits that we're not fully committed to having an equitable solution to those problems. Mm -hmm. Let me take my first question from the um, Q and A. Uh, so somebody has a question for uh, Gabrielle. Um, will a wealth tax lead to distortion and investment toward very illiquid assets that are not easily valued? I don't know, like a painting or something, um, giving the owner, you know, more room to dispute tax liability. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great question, and that's something that um, can be addressed, in my view, by uh, creating market values. You know, when the market values don't exist, so the proper way to tax illiquid assets would be first the IRS would try to value those assets based on the price of similar. Let's say you know you have a private business that makes X in profits, employs you no know, Y uh, individuals, has Z in sales. And then you, know, you look at how similar markets and similar sectors are valued by the stock market for listed firms. And you apply those ratios to private businesses. The IRS could do that and could say, look, we think your business is worth X. And so that's how much you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Second is if the taxpayers are unhappy with the IRS valuation for some reason, they could also have the option to pay in kind with shares. So let's say the wealth tax is 2%. And let's say the bill is, uh, you know, $100 million in, in, in tax. They, they think, you know, it's too much. So instead of paying $100 million, they would give 2% of their shares to the government. The point is not for the government to become a shareholder in private businesses. The government would then resell those shares, you know, to the highest bidder on the market, thus, in effect, creating the market that currently is missing and creating the market values that, that currently do not uh, exist. So... Uh, that's one illustration of the idea that, you know, these, these, these difficulties, which are real, they are not insuperable and, and we can innovate uh, and, and make sure that the wealth tax uh, works well. Um, I have a question maybe for uh, Katerina, um, although maybe also for Gabriel. On the topic of corporate taxes, what are your thoughts on OECD efforts on multinational international profit shifting and digital services taxes? Do you think this will help with global inequality? I think it's much needed. Um, whether it will resolve all issues is a different question, but uh, clearly we have to have new international tax rules. Um, our international tax regime goes back to the 1920s or so, and we typically are looking for a physical footprint to um, enable a, a, a state to make a legitimate claim to tax. And as we are moving to less physical um, um, uh, economic operations that nonetheless basically, uh, you know, extract rents from local consumers, if you want, uh, we have to find ways to tax that. So I think it's, it's a very good approach to find other mechanisms or to lay claims on taxable um, uh, resources in ways that is uh, distinct from a real physical uh, footprint. Uh, we need, of course, the buy-in to do that, and it's and and the calculations might be a little bit complicated. But I think it's it's a it's a move in the right direction. So we had a question: um, Could the panel comment on student loan debt forgiveness? Trevon already um, brought the topic up. It seems like such a move would support both race and class justice. I should add, just you know, to keep this in the um, uh, you know current uh, events. It seems you know there was a uh, a town hall in which uh, President Biden uh, expressed uh, very negative views toward um, forgiving uh, student loans on the idea that uh, there's a relative, that the class politics there would be um, regressive. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to give it a start. So I think, um, uh, you know, student loans was the latest big consumer asset class that expanded greatly after the 2009 crisis. And mm -hmm. we also have to look at it from that perspective, it's not just students who need a loan and then, but I think it's, you know, we're, we're creating or we're finding more and more the financial sector is finding more and more assets to put into the securitization machine um, and, 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 and live off the fees that you create in that way. And it puts a lot of burden on those debtors. Um, so the, the fact that we rely so much on debt rather than income to fund so many important social resources, including education, I think is a, is a fundamental problem. So we have to address that and just forgiving um, student loans now, now won't do this, but it would help a lot. I think there is a point that Biden has about the class um, distribution effects. You know, I think it, it does, it makes to me much more sense to forgive loans to people who have, um, who are at lower income scales, who have less ability to um, um, deal with that. Probably for political reasons, it's, it's easier to do either or, but it won't completely then, you know, again, sort of you're, you're helping both ends at the, in, in the wealth gap. Um, but overall, it's also a generational issue. And I think I would go for a real um, reduction in student loan across the board if we can get this now. 
That actually reminds me of one of my favorite topics that I don't think it's discussed quite a, quite enough in the inter in the inequality debate, which is intergenerational um, inequality. So, you know, in general, the older population is um, more white, less diverse. Um, so I think it kind of, uh, you know, they have more assets. So I think, that, you know, sort of intergenerational tensions uh, unite a lot of the speakers on the on the panel and throughout the day. So, you know, how do you see um, intergenerational tensions in the U.S.? Um, had they always been thus? Do you see them as being especially fraught uh, in the recent years? Um, and do you think COVID, uh, you know, you read articles in the New York Times where, uh, the young, you know, feel like they're being asked to sacrifice for the old. Um, and do you think of, you know, intergenerational uh, components of inequality as as relevant? Um, or, you know, we're all going to be old one day, so uh, it sort of all works out in the end. I can I can say if you will. So I think that. Uh, that's absolutely right. That that uh, the COVID pandemic is uh, exacerbating the uh, intergenerational uh, inequities that exist. I think the other key dimension is obviously the the, the, the huge climate debt that the current generations are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, transmitting to future generations. At the same time, I would like to emphasize that. Um, um, when you get wealth, what's very striking is that um, uh, there's as much wealth inequality within each age group than in the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. So if you look, you know, people age between the 20 and 30, the top 1% has about 40% of total wealth. Same thing, you know, for between 30 and 40. And so uh, that, that, that means that, you know, the, 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 the pure, if you want, uh, uh, class within age group dimension of inequality is at least, you know, for wealth is really essential. Um, Trevon, a question for you. Um, you started with a provocative question. The question is not how, but whether we want to address unequal public policies. Do you think that in the current climate of resurgence of white supremacy makes it more difficult or would it actually awaken national consciousness and you know, as a good opportunity, you know, to push more equitable policies? I guess, you know, I think the historical record, you know, the reaction of Bull Connor was what sort of woke up the nation in uh, 1963. Are we potentially going through such a moment with the, you know, capital insurgency and, you know, Donald Trump was president for four years. That kind of is a striking thing we didn't think we'd see. I, th I think those moments always make us relatively optimistic after something that is that salient. Um, after seeing some of the violence of the civil rights movement, after seeing um, the, the violence uh, that we saw at the Capitol on January 6th, the, the problem I think in, in, in thinking that it's going to go in either direction is that we forget that we have a very long legacy of racialized violence. And it has never compelled us as a nation to get over the hump of these um, uh, racially informed policies, particularly with respect to wealth redistribution, taxation, and the provision of public goods. So we have confronted the monster many, many times, and it has not compelled us fully to move and adopt and change in our economic policies. So as shocking as events of the Capitol um, on January 6th, where we do see you know, an insurrection uh, in the seat of our government, the seat of our democracy, we have bombed so many churches and killed so many innocent African-Americans and lynched so many innocent African-Americans and used police power. Um, we've turned fire hoses on children. Everything that you can imagine that you can do over the scope of terroristic activity has been done in America's past. And we stare at it and we are disgusted by it. And then we move right along into what we've been doing, um, it seems, for the entirety of American history. So I do think it could happen, but I'm not necessarily uh, suggesting that if you look at our history, that there are these inflection points of which we've seen, say, in the last five years that would move us um, in that direction. So with a question about, um, you know, I guess I have one question. I'm sort of building off a question that somebody um, asked in the Q&A. 
Um, and I guess this, you know, do we think of the rise of the populist right, let's say in Europe, um, is there a lot? Is there a lot of lessons that America can, um, with you know, our longer history of racial diversity? Certainly, Europe is becoming much more diverse than it used to be via immigration, often from former colonies. I mean, do we think that some of the tensions that you see? I mean, Le, there was a recent poll suggesting Le Pen is you know shoulder to shoulder, is, is neck and neck with um, Macron. Um, you know, Brexit. Uh, do you see these? Um, these developments as you know very um analogous to post-civil rights rise of um reaganism uh you might think uh similarly you know a reaction to a black president being president uh trump uh or you know is each story kind of have each country have its own specific um uh story to tell or, or are these you know general lessons about you know, the rise of right wing populism being, you know, about white majorities being challenged um, in terms of their majority position. You know, I think um, the patterns are similar, the specific minorities that are targeted differ, but I think the the pattern of, of bl blaming um, others and victimizing yourselves is something that we see being exploited by politicians in a particular um, a context all the time. You know, I, but I, I do also see a, a, another similarity that cuts across the experience of the US, the UK, other parts in Europe, and which, and which where I th also think that um, also the right-wing populists have a point. I think there is a gut feeling to which they are reacting, which is that they have lost control over their destiny. Mm -hmm. And they're being fed stories, how to explain the loss of control. And I think these happen to be the wrong stories, but it makes them vulnerable and open to these kind of stories. And then certain types of politicians um, exploit that. But the kind of story that I'm telling is how we have outsourced the law and how we have basically made it possible for powerful private actors to source state power for their own end at the expense of everybody else. I think that's, these are for me the mechanisms that have basically meant that most other people have lost control over the destiny. And also we have lost control over our collective way in which we have organized a, a common destiny in the way that Mariana was suggesting earlier today that we have this common project, right? So we have destroyed many of these institutions practices and 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 conventions to do that. Um, and, and I think that that has just um, made all of us, all societies more vulnerable. But how this manifests itself is varies from country to country and has a lot to do, to do with their um, ingrained, deeply ingrained um, prejudices and, and, and racial or, or ethnic um, uh, uh, deviances that, 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 that they have institutionalized very often and that come to the fore in this, in this context. Um, so maybe this is the, I, I kind of lost track of time, but this might be the last question. Um, and I guess, you know, we can't, we're here on Zoom because of COVID. Uh, so that's the, uh, obviously the animating force everywhere now. Do you think COVID, uh, I guess this is sort of similar to the question I asked about Trevon. So often I think, I mean, I'm not making any deep point, crises are uh, moments that, you know, don't, don't let a crisis go to waste. I think uh, was something Mariana said earlier, can, do you see COVID as, uh, potentially a positive turning point, uh, whether it's on issues like racial justice or, um, as you know, Katarina said, the, you know, the, the need to coordinate um, uh, Gabriel, you know, an impetus for clawing back some of the great wealth gains that uh, certain groups have made, you know, certain um, companies have made uh, during the pandemic. Uh, do you think in five years or 10 years, you know, uh, pundits will say, well, COVID was a real turning point in a good way. And don't, and don't feel like you're forced to end on an optimistic note. I'm, I'm Eastern European, you know, I'm used to uh, gray skies. I'm not so, I'm, I'm not so optimistic, you know, I, I, I don't think that a crisis like COVID in itself is enough to change policy to change things you know what drives changes is social movements political movements kind of long longer run changes in uh, in, in ideologies you know in 
in politics and, and, and the confluence of a certain historical context with a set of pre-existing ideas and, and, and movements. And, and so, you know, unfortunately, COVID in itself, I don't see it bringing anything good. Now, maybe I'm too pessimistic, but when I look at the, the debate, for instance, on uh, taxation in the US, you know, I don't, I don't see anyone talking about an excess profits tax, which is something that happened in the past, you know, during periods of wars or, you know, national disasters, when certain actors benefit a lot from disa you know, these disasters, where the rest of the population suffers. This is something the US did historically a number of times, but you no, know, this is nowhere on, on, the, radar, on the radar today. Um, so, yeah, sorry to, uh, to not be so... Uh, so no, 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 I, I really That's didn't want sugarcoated. I mean, you just, you bring up a really nice, I mean, FDR was famous in World War II for saying, I don't want there to be any war millionaires. And you don't hear that by Biden, by, by Trump. So that's a really, it's a really not striking contrast. Uh, Trevon, Katerina, do you, how do you, and COVID is certainly, I think, one of the most strange, bizarre, historic things we've, we're all living with. Um, in my lifetime, it feels like the most historic thing. I've lived it through. Do you see this being a turning point for the, you know, the issues that animate you as scholars? So let me say that I think, um, and I'll be, uh, I realize now I'm, 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 I'm the American on the, on the panel, I guess. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be the optimistic American actually, which is very <laughs> rare. Um, I think that we are at the end, if we're thinking about political time, of the sort of Reagan revolutionary period. I think those arguments no longer have the sway that they did in 1980 and certainly don't have the sway that they did even in 2000, where we thought about these things working in this way. We know something is wrong in which we have people in the state of Texas right now who are without electricity for several days due to a love of deregulation. We now see proposals, for example, by President Biden to have significant impacts on the elimination of child poverty that I don't think would have even have been possible in a previous administration, Democrat or Republican, for someone to suggest. So I think that we're coming to an end of some of the things that seem to work so well in the past. Um, as Gabriel said, you know, you talk about things like increasing the minimum wage and wealth taxes, and you have support in both political parties for these things. The problem is our political language has not changed because we've been speaking in the same language for the past 40 years. I think our language is changing, but it's changing very slowly. So what we're trying to do right now is to fit a square into a circle. But eventually, I think that process is going to give way to something that is different. I'm not necessarily sure that all the underlying forces will be um, any, any different or changed, but I do think the range of policies and what we think of as possible by the government fundamentally is going to be altered by this coronavirus experience. Yeah, I think I, I'll just agree, I think, with both what has been said, but it's not going to happen on its own. I think it really it really requires massive leadership and the willingness to reshape and reconstitute. And I don't quite see that yet, uh, but I think there is a potential. Um, so I think we have actually a few more minutes. I think I had my, uh, the schedule was slightly off. Um, the pan uh, So a question from the audience um, to build on the conversations of investment and redistribution, could the panel comment on U.S. efforts related to reparations, such as the U.S. House bill to study reparations, or Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen's recent book? Um, you know, this was, I think, put on the popular um, uh, radar by Ta-Nehisi Coates' article from um, The Atlantic a few years ago, although I certainly know that's not the first time that serious work has been put into the question, but I think he put it on the public radar. And so um, if you could, uh, I think they would, uh, the person would love the reactions from the whole panel. So I'll, I'll go first being probably uh, the closest, uh, closest related to it. And I've worked uh, a bit with Dr. Darity, uh, um, uh, Derek Hamilton and many others who have been active in, in reparations and that policy. And so there is greater traction now. I think um, the debate about HR 40, which is earlier this week was a bit um, interesting. Um, I never thought Herschel Walker should be someone with particularly salient thoughts about reparations, but he is, is, is one of the people that they choose to speak. So I think we're talking about it. 
And I think we're talking about it and that's, um, for some people they say that, that there's no action in this talk, but there has to be talk before there is action. And we have to, and I think in, in agreeing with uh, Katharina and, and, and Gabriel that um, we talk about things in the United States long before we actually move to them. You know, it, it was crazy to talk about emancipation in the United States in 1820 or 1840, but in 1865, it actually arrived. So I do think it is important to have those discussions. And it's important to talk about what that actually means in terms of what the great thing is, is we've actually settled a debate not about what reparations is, but how it would actually form the function that it would take about eliminating racial wealth inequality. That's a very important um, a thing to actually talk about and addressing what we were discussing earlier, which are these racially specific um, uh, injuries that have happened over American history that we know are cumulative and that build upon each other, um, leading to the wealth disparities that we have today. So I think the discussion is, is wonderful. I do not like HR 40 in its current form because I would like for the president, uh, the, the congressional committee to have a, a, a sunrise and sunset date and to have specific, more spe specificity in its charges about what it was going to bring. And then to actually enact legislation that would bring that about. But again, I think we also have discussions about, well, who is qualifying, who are the beneficiaries? And I think all those things are necessary as a nation to confront our history and how what we see today as racial disparities are the product of a long run historical process. So I think it could be quite generative um, if it is done appropriately, but to see it at this level now, if you would have told me 10 years ago that we would see something like this, I would have, I would have laughed in your face. So I do think there's been significant progress um, in the reparations sphere. And do you, Trevon, do you credit that progress with just whatever it is that the underlying, as you said earlier, appeal of Reaganomics has declined, whatever that sort of social force is that, do you think that's one and the same? Or is this a separate uh, um, separate reason why reparations is, is viewed as something that's no longer crazy to talk about? I hesitate to sort of to, to guess, but I think it could be the confluence of two things. One, we saw after the Great Recession that people who lived by the rules and did the right things that we say to do in American society and went to school and purchased a home and did these sorts of things were literally wiped out by a corrupt financial system that was racially exploitative. And so that I think caused people to realize that some of the things that we say would close the racial wealth gap are not going to close the racial wealth gap. And we exist in a, in a world in which we have to realize that we actually enriched a lot of people simultaneously for the purpose of impoverishing other people, right? And that, that really, I think, struck people in a very strong way. I think that is a, is a critical moment. And then when we see the statistics about student rates and we start thinking about the intergenerational effects and what wealth really is and how it's created and how it's intertwined with government policy, the books that have come out about the color of money, about sort of um, opportunity hoarders and all these other sorts of things gets us thinking much more generally about American inequality. And so certainly uh, Gabriel's work looking at um, American mobility and inequality and increasing inequality. I think that general conversation about that has opened the door for a discussion about reparations. All right, I think that might, um, Gabrielle, uh, Katarina, any thoughts on, um, anything to add on, on the topic of reparations? No, just to say that I really um, uh, agree with Trevon that um, the, 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 the experience of the crisis and the fact that it's not just, you know, your fault if you don't make it, but sort of the, the, the fact that we can be exposed to forces that we cannot control and lose everything or I'm just, just not able to make it. I think that has uh, created a, a greater reception or a willingness to, to, to engage in these kind of debates more generally. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we can move on beyond uh, where we are right now. Um, yeah, totally agree with uh, Trevon as well. Um, Ajif, I think I'm going to uh, I, uh, hand it back over to you. I want to say just a special thank you to Trevon, Gabrielle, and Katerina uh, for joining us. I for joining us today. It was you know a, an honor to to moderate uh, such a great panel, and uh, thank you to the audience uh, for your provocative questions. Thank you, uh, Eliana, for moderating it, and Gabriel, Katrina, and Trevon. That was uh, really terrific. I learned a lot. So um, I just want to thank everyone who has uh, joined us throughout this two-day conference. All of the conversations, the panels, the keynotes, uh, they will be uh, available over YouTube. So you can send the links to your friends and so on.
Um, I just want to close by thanking uh, a couple of people who really worked very hard to make this possible in the age of COVID, uh, Pallavi Nuka, um, as well as uh, Nancy Turco. So thank you so much, a round of applause. And uh, as always, uh, thank you to um, everyone who joined us. And I very much hope that next year when we do this, we, we can all meet in person. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.